Welcome everyone to the Global Learning Exchange series on digital payments organized by international labor organization Better Work and the Better Than Cash Alliance on the impact and challenges of digital wage payments in the global garment industry. I am Tid Harvald, I'm the Deputy Managing Director of the Better Than Cash Alliance and I will be your moderator for today's session. I will start by giving the floor to Dan Rees from Better Work. Dan Rees, the floor is yours. I have the great pleasure of launching this first seminar, uh, first webinar of a, of a global series on digital wage payments. And this series is a collaboration, as Tida said, between the International Labour Organization, the International Finance Corporation, and the United Nations Capital Development Fund, Better Than Cash Alliance. And our aim for these webinars is to help develop the understanding of the technical, the functional, and the learning objectives that will help drive responsible digital wage transformation in the garment industry, but also in other sectors and indeed in the informal sector. Now, last year, the ILO joined the Better Than Cash Alliance, and membership to the Alliance it was very timely for us because it resonates very strongly with our new strategic priorities that were, were agreed in our centenary year. And ILO is now very focused on promoting a human-centered approach to the future of work, a world of work that's more just, that's more inclusive, and more equitable for the many millions of people who still do not enjoy their basic human rights at work. And one important dimension of that agenda is to harness the power of dig digital technologies to promote better outcomes for workers, including those in the gig economy, in supply chains, and workplaces in the informal sector. And it's our conviction as an organization that the adoption of responsible digital payments has a, potential, has a potential to advance that cause by enhancing the productivity and sustainability of enterprises, by expanding financial inclusion and social protection of workers, and by promoting the formalization of employment. Now, my main role within the International Labour Organization is the director of the Better Work Program. Better Work is itself a global partnership between ILO and the International Finance Corporation. And we bring together firms and stakeholders from across the garment industry to, move, to improve working conditions and respect for labor rights, but also the competitiveness of apparel enterprises. And we work with some 1,700 factories in nine different countries that produce garments, which employ um, um, almost two and a half million workers in the garment industry. And those workers are are mainly women, many of them are migrants. Um, the vast majority of them are young, um, below the age of, of 35. Uh, they're, they're the very kind of people we talk about when we talk about um, the bottom 40% and the need to improve Anybody conditions for right the better. bottom 40%. And our vision is a global garment industry that lifts those kind of people out of poverty by providing decent work, by empowering women and driving business competitiveness and promoting inclusive economic growth. And Better Work as a program has become increasingly invested in promoting transformation to responsible digital payments. It's a journey we've been on for some time and it's one that's dramatically speeded up during the global pandemic. Over the first half of this year, we've seen a rapid move towards digital payment as governments and private sector alike adapt to the new realities and use digital payments to make quick and safe tra cash transactions. And ILO and our partners in this webinar series believe that while this could be a breakthrough moment, it's also really important, particularly under the intense pressure of the current crisis, that the impacts of this shift are well understood, that the technology is used responsibly and the needs of the most vulnerable are really well known and are safeguarded. So with that in mind, we really look forward to the discussion today we look forward to a discussion on the impacts uh, the pandemic has had on the transition towards responsible digital payment and the challenges and the opportunities there are to move that needle even further. And we have two aspirations uh, for this series of seminars. Firstly, we hope to build our collective knowledge, learning and shared information to better understand the opportunity and the context um, for the transformation to digital financial services. And secondly, um, that this supports those that participate to take 
collective action that mitigates the risks and seizes the opportunities that there surely are um, to go forward with a transition towards responsible digital payments for workers and employers. And with those introductory remarks, let me uh, hand back to our moderator for today, Tida. Tida Wells is the Deputy Managing Director of the Berlin Work, um, the Berlin Cash Alliance, and he will be our moderator for today and will be introducing the panelists and, the, and moderating the proceedings. Back to you, Tida. Thank you very much, Dan, for this great introduction and for laying out for all of us the vision of ILO on this topic. We are really pleased to have so many of you join us for this important topic, and I see that the number of attendees is just going up all the time by the second. As Dan mentioned, the series has been designed with all of you in mind. It started with actually a couple of informal calls that we had between a few of you uh, with us today, and we realized really quickly that there was a lot of interest in this topic, which is why we decided to organize this as an invite-only series that will be held regularly. And we're looking, as Dan mentioned, to do three things. One, it's a regular forum for you, uh, the key organizations working on the transition to digital wages, for you to share tools and resources and lessons and things that you have seen uh, in your experience on the ground. We would also like to build connections and collaboration between you, particularly because in so many countries, the transition is happening quickly now and due to COVID-19, of course, and no one should have to reinvent the wheel. And finally, we're looking to really support and foster necessary partnerships um, because in order to drive the responsible transition to digital payment in a way that makes employees' life better, which is, I believe, the key that uh, is bringing all of us together today, we really need to have to work together. So today is an inaugural meeting, which is in the form of a webinar, but moving forward, this meeting will be in smaller groups, very focused on one theme or one country, and will really give you the space and time to build those connections and partnerships. We will therefore be conducting a poll at the end of this uh, call today, right at the end of the session, so that you can help us shape the future of this series with the themes or country focus that are most relevant and value for you. So please stay to take the, stay to take the poll in the end. And if you need to leave early, just email us. Thank you. Um, so we are now going to uh, move to our webinar. We will be leaving enough time for Q&A at the begin at the end. So if you have questions during the presentation, you don't have to wait for the end. Just type them into the Q&A box that you have at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And we will try to get as many as possible during that session. Now, on to our webinar. As Dan mentioned, governments, companies, communities, have all experienced tremendous acceleration of digital payments in the past few months due to the global pandemic. With billions of people under lockdown, governments, companies, UN agencies, NGOs realized that the need to accelerate digitization of wages or of benefits or of family payments is pressing. We at the Better Cash Alliance have seen this with our members, Colombia, where the government opened millions of new accounts in the span of a few weeks in Jordan, which promoted opening mobile wallets, and in India, of course. And in Bangladesh, the ready-made garment sector opened an estimated 2.5 million new accounts after the government's COVID-19 wage relief fund mandated that all series, sorry, that all um, salaries should be paid digitally. This transition is exactly the theme for today's discussion, which we'll explore from all angles. The role of government, the role of a factory owner, what is the perspective of employees, and what is the role international organizations like ILO play in this space. And I have the pleasure of introducing our great panelists for today's discussion. Our first panel speaker, Mr. Vijoy Kumar Singh, who is the additional secretary and financial advisor for the Ministry of Textiles in the government of India. Mr. Singh is a mechanical engineer whose experience spends over three decades serving in different ministries and sectors such as finance, industry and commerce, and now textiles. We're pleased to have you with us. Second, we're pleased to introduce Ms. Maisha Khan, who is director at the Ananta Companies in Bangladesh. Ananta Companies owns ready-made garment production facilities in Bangladesh with over 15,000 employees, 70% of them are women. Ananta Companies produce garment for export and works with some leading brands around the world. Maisha joined Ananta Companies after her graduation from the University in Texas in 2016 has been splitting her time between the merchandising office in Texas 
and the company's headquarters in Bangladesh, and she looks after the corporate social responsibility activities and is active in day-to-day -day operations and strategic policy making. Then we will have Ms. Daniela Ortega from Microfinance Opportunities. Daniela is currently managing the Garment Worker Diaries project in Bangladesh, which I'm sure many of you on this uh, webinar today have heard of. The project tracks the economic lives of 1,300 garment workers through weekly interviews. Ms. Ortega is an attorney by training and will be speaking about what the data tells us about the impact of the transition to digital pay during the COVID-19 crisis in Bangladesh. And lastly, we will have Valérie Breda, who is a technical expert at the ILO Social Finance Program Enterprises Department at the ILO headquarters in Geneva. Valérie focuses on innovating and testing social financial intervention and providing technical advice about what works to facilitate access to finance. She works on promoting access to finance for micro and small entrepreneurs, for youth and for workers, with a focus on digital finance and on financial education. She's been exploring how the transition to digital wage payments contribute to promoting decent work, which is Sustainable Development Goal 8. Thank you all for being with us today. So let's start with you, Additional Secretary, Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh, the government of India has been investing early in foundational infrastructure for digital payments with a focus on strengthening the systems and processes for digital social transfers or DBT as they are called in India. Specifically for the garment sector, even before COVID-19, India was a global leader in terms of the percentage of garment employees being paid digitally. I would like to show this slide here, which is based on research that we at the Better Than Cash Alliance published with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, based on responses to the HIG index questionnaire, which many of you know well, we compared the percentage of workers being paid digitally around the world. As you can see from this slide, India came first, largely first before any other country in the region. Uh, these are, of course, pre-COVID crisis numbers, and now other countries, as we are going to see, like Bangladesh, are quickly catching up. In response to the COVID-19 crisis, the government of India launched the scheme Garib Kalyan Yorajana, or GKY, under which a total of 24 billion US dollars have been transferred as social support to nearly 320 million people using digital infrastructure that enabled direct transfers into bank accounts of beneficiaries. We are speaking today to Mr. Singh to understand what is the role of governments in driving responsible digital wages. Mr. Skin, we would like to ask you, what were the key investments that proved to be critical when the crisis hit and you knew you need, need to make payments to the most vulnerable? Was it government policy or infrastructure, private sector innovation? What made this quick response to hundreds of millions of people so successful. Over to you, Mr. Singh. Yeah, good afternoon, friends. Uh, if we say that government did something for this crisis, then I think it's not correct. What we have seen in India, the government at the highest level has been consistently promoting digital inclusion, inclusion financial inclusion for everybody for the last decade, 10 years. It's the basically work of last 10 years. If 10 years back or even five years back, if you would have thought that in India, we will be making billions of digital payment monthly, then nobody would have believed it because we had a banking system where these payments are ha were happening in limited banking hours and a lot of limitations that in one uh, bank, if you have to send money to a different bank account, it was very, very difficult. So for even a garment manufacturer then, it was impossible to pay digitally as it is happening now. So what the first thing which happened was the in identity. The government of India set, uh, did set up that universal identity UIDI, uh, Authority of India, basically. So that and with, which has the, all the details of all citizens and the biometric details also. So that is that was required to just confirm the identity, and then the banks started opening their accounts on the basis of electronic KYC, know your customer, because earlier Indians had very few 
identity document. Only less than 5% people had the most well-known identity document that was used to be the passport. Then another 10-20% used to work through some other uh, document which was not so uh, well accepted across the country. So this eKYC, uh, which, which came on the basis of that universal identity thing, Aadhaar, which is known as Aadhaar in India. So then everybody started getting opening in the account anywhere on the basis of this identity because nobody can forge it because it works with the help of fingerprinting and even the iris scan. So it was a very high tech and uh, latest thing. So that was able to prevent fraud. There has been no breach of any such this security feature till now in the last 10 years. So the first step was setting up of Aadhaar uh, system and then government promoted financial inclusion at a large scale because we had less than 20-25% people who, who had bank account 10 years back and if the earlier pace would have continued it would have taken 50-60 to years to achieve. Today around 80% people in our country they have bank account and most of those accounts have been opened in the last 5-6 years with the help of those electronic KYC. So that was the first uh, step. Then the second, after when the uh, people started having account, the other some payment system was uh, introduced by some private companies and all like the bank started uh, setting up their wallets and through that some easy payment used to happen but it's still the number used to be very, very limited because it was not interoperable across the banking platform. So then in 2016, the basic thing which has, uh, which has been the game changer, and I think that is still unique in the world. No other country has that system. A public sector non-profit set up under, in the central bank, which is the Reserve Bank of India, did set up a corporation called as National Payment Corporation of India. It's a non-profit company and here the, all the banks and they did set up a backbone of universal payment interface which is used by all banks and every even a small non-banking company, even a small even individual are ready to use the, this platform. So this platform which was in the public domain with the open source architecture was made available and on the basis of this uh, UPI which is managed by NPCI which is part of the central banking the huge number of entrepreneurial companies like they have started setting up their own payment system like uh, the government also started with one UPI based system but now all the banks even non-banking uh, companies they have set up their own soft uh, apps and all which can make payment from one bank to another any bank anybody can get paid instantaneously 24 hours a day and seven days a week non-stop so this huge public infrastructure has come as a boom now even for small payment plus uh, people this infrastructure was readily available at the same time when we hit this crisis at the time of crisis, payment by digital means became a compulsion. But fortunately, India had this infrastructure. Those companies had already set up those things, uh, apps and for payment system. And the uh, people had their account linked to those apps and all. So it came as a boon for the government to send benefit to the uh, poor citizen, which was a great success and it has been appreciated so well. And in 2016, when government did this demonetization again to promote the digital uh, payment in the country, after that there was a direction from the government that no payment more than 20,000 rupees will be done by cash. So there was a restriction that a bigger payment cannot be done by cash, so it has to be by a banking channel. And then at the same time, the digital uh, payment made a, such an easy alternative that people shifted quickly. So now what happens that most of our working people, 
have their account linked to this app, that UPI app, and anybody can be paid anywhere. So even if you hire a taxi, or a last uh, yesterday there was a gardener who came to my house to work, and we paid him through his Google Pay. So he had his account was linked, and we paid him directly. So it's so easy and so convenient. So that that has been major uh, reason. Basically, the consistent effort of government of India to provide a basic public infrastructure and confidence and trust of the central bank and all bank accepting it, the uh, system and the interoperability and, and with an identity infrastructure. The whole thing which is known as Indian stack, that is the basic uh, key of the success of digital payment uh, thing which is happening in India. Still, there are people who are not linked to the system. So we government is still keen to extend it to uh, take the financial inclusion to next level where we have around 95, 92, 98 percent people connected. So that's the basic thing which I would like. I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Mr. Singh. And following the success of this government scheme to open accounts, the PMJDY scheme, we have seen the government introduce the Payment of Wages Amendment Act of 2017 which required that every person employed in industrial or other such establishment be paid uh, his or her wages um, into a bank account. And so uh, would you, how would you say that this also change made it possible to send, uh, to, to beef up the system when the crisis hit? Yeah, yeah, basically this crisis, even the payment to the farmers, the poor people that Garib Kalyan Yojana you were talking, these all payments have gone uh, online and there has been immediate transfer and people have received the money and they have all been very happy about it. Yes. Thank you very much. We can, uh, we will go back to some of those questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Ms. Khan, we would like to speak to you now. We understand and we all heard that the ready-made garment industry in Bangladesh is going through a massive and rapid transition to digital pay due to COVID-19. Last year, during the November 2019 Digital Payment Summit in Dhaka that we co-organized with many of the actors on this call today, the government set the target to get 90% of government workers, garment workers in digital wages system by 2021. A similar commitment was made by the Exporters Association, BGAMEA. Uh, now, informal data we're getting from Better Work Factories show that 45% of Better Work Factories paid workers digitally in March, and in April, this number went to 94%. Other estimates that the ready-made garment sector opened 2.5 million new accounts following the government's COVID-19 wage relief fund mandated that all salaries be paid digitally. This is an astonishing rate of change and one that needs to be accompanied by support and grievance redressal mechanisms and other responsible practices. What we want to ask you is that given that shifting to digital payments benefit, of course, employers and employees, and we know through reduced costs and higher efficiency for administration, uh, it also helped promote stronger business relationship. There are also challenges and risks. And we wanted to ask about that. What, as an entrepreneur, what was the biggest lesson you learned on transitioning from cash to digital pay during COVID-19? What have been the challenges? What have been the opportunities? And what have you done to engage workers on this change? Ms. Khan, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for your question, Dinar. Um, so Bangladesh is a country of 164 million people. The RMG sector has been the backbone of the country with 83% of total export earnings and since after COVID employs around 3.6 million workers. So during the COVID pandemic, we actually found ourselves um, in a situation where 100% digital wage payment was not only a necessity, it was really our only option. Um, our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's Digital Bangladesh 2021 program, which puts emphasis on the application of ICTs, Information and Communication Technology, as a pro-poor tool for Bangladesh's development, 
encouraged the RMG sector's initiative to go cashless. Um, following her guidelines, uh, BGMEA President Rubana Hawk equipped companies like ours to begin this transition actually way before the first confirmed case in Bangladesh on March 8th. So by 2019, Ananta companies had already transitioned to 56% digital wage payments. Now to take advantage of the government's, so now during COVID time, to take advantage of the government's initial 588 million stimulus package that's intended to help the export oriented factories cover three months wage, we were required to submit the sal sal salary sheets of workers from December to February of 2019, the list of workers and each of their banking or mobile banking accounts. So this required extreme co cooperation of key stakeholders externally and internally. Um, and this includes the Bangladesh government, Bangladesh bank, BGMEA, RMG factory owners, MFS providers, commercial banks, as well as the workers. So as we, um, on the companies, had already the readiness and IT capabilities, we were able to secure this loan. But like you said, there were many challenges. The biggest challenge we faced as a company was the fact that um, a lot of the workers did not have sufficient ID documentation, such as their national ID cards or even the birth certificate, which um, MFS providers allowed us to have as an alternative to NIDs. I know Mr. Singh before me mentioned um, India and their ID system in Bangladesh. Similarly, um, in Bangladesh, government requires everyone to have, an, have national IDs. However, it was found that many RMG workers still didn't have it. So it was hard to satisfy the know your client portion of opening MFS accounts. So what happened was our team had to get in touch with all 13,000 workers to collect and verify this information within a matter of two weeks. So this was a huge ask as most of our company personnel were working from home due to COVID and most of the workers had already gone to their respective villages. Um, and after the workers collected their, but after the workers collected their documentation, um, somehow through the union council, through government offices, the next challenge actually came when um, the workers had to submit this documentation. So due to the workers' low scope of mobile usage and lack of digital literacy, um, it was really hard for them to scan the documents and send it to us for us to submit that to the commercial banks. Um, although in Bangladesh, workers have, 90% of the uh, Bangladesh population have access to mobile phones. It turns out that in our company, we have found that only 20% of our RMG workers have smartphones. So uh, when they got their national IDs, their birth certificates um, to create these accounts, they needed to actually find someone with a smartphone since they didn't have it to send the pictures of, or the documents to us to upload uh, to create these MFS accounts. So what happened was in April during the shutdown, um, all these e-registration points were also closed. So our MFS provider had to ask the government for a special permission to keep these e-registration points open throughout the country to stay uh, so that RMG workers were able to go to these e-registration points um, as they are all over the country in villages and in the city um, while maintaining social distance in order for them to open these MFS accounts. So in the end, like I said, we were successful. Um, but only had 20 to 30 workers who were not able to create these MFS accounts and we had to end up paying them manually. Now, uh, what are we doing to engage these workers on this huge change? So at Ananta companies currently, um, I would say that uh, the workers information level or digital literacy level is at an intermediate level after joint effort from service provider, brands, development partners, and factory management. So they receive training on various levels. The first one, uh, the first level of training that they received is actually when they open their MFS accounts. MFS providers actually conduct one-on-one -on -one training and they also use TV adver advertisements to help guide workers on how to um, open the accounts on their own. So step two would be at on the companies where we conducted internal MFS training with materials provided by brands and development partners. And the training focused on educating workers 
um, on the advantages of digital wage payments and increasing their comfort level with MFS usage and mobile phone usage. Um, we used our PA system for reminders regarding rules, regulations, and how to's three times a day, starting two days before payday. And we also sent workers leaflets to study at home and posters on factory floor as continued education process. Um, the last two would be we have actually designated welfare agents for assigned for MFS troubleshooting on every single floor, especially since women feel uncomfortable um, going to male supervisors. We actually have women's uh, welfare agents just so that they can feel comfortable going up and asking questions. We also have an MFS hotline in case workers have any problems. And finally, um, or we have an MFS agent on site on payday uh, for any questions and cash out um, requirements. Thank you. Thank you for this really, really comprehensive presentation. I wanted to ask you, how do you ensure women employees benefit from the transition? Sure, um, so women we have found benefit significantly from this. Uh, wage digitization pays for financial paves way for financial inclusion inclusion, which simply put for women means freedom in Bangladesh. So 65% of the company's supply chain workforce are women. Uh, digital wage payments empowers low income women and as a result contributes to sustainable development goals to promote gender equality. Just to share our experience a little bit, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, if you can picture it, it was common for men to line up in front of the factory gates on payday to immediately collect the wage payment payments from their wives. So um, now with the privacy and security of digital wage payments, our female workers report that they have much more control over their finances and the number of women who are actually handing out their pay to their spouses or their fathers sometimes have significantly reduced. So women are now making joint financial decisions with their partners and their parents and as a result feel much more confident and prepared for unexpected health emergencies, paying for school fees or planning for the future. Um, Additionally, they learned about other financial products such as savings, credit, and insurance, and started using reward points and merchant discounts. Um, they were now able to send money to their families anytime without fear of theft and loss and without anyone's permission. Our surveys actually showed, so our internal surveys actually showed something really wonderful. Um, we found that young female workers in our factories have now started expressing more interest in furthering their own education and opening their own businesses someday, since they're now able to budget and save more on their own. Um, so really amazing things are happening due to this um, change. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Maisha. Now I would like to hand it over to Daniela Ortega. Uh, Daniela, you have been work leading the work on the government worker diaries, as I mentioned in the beginning, which collects the data on the financial lives of workers in the ready-made garment industry in Bangladesh. And you look at work hours and income and expenses. And the objective of the project is to have the data to inform governments, factory and brand initiatives. Many of them are on the line today. So, from April to May, you surveyed roughly 1,400 workers, three quarters of those were women. And the aim was to better understand their experience in transitioning to digital wages, particularly in the response to COVID-19. Can you tell us what the data shows from the worker diaries and how the rapid increase in digital wage payments has impacted workers? Yes, thank you for the question and for the opportunity to share what we're hearing from workers in Bangladesh. So overall, what we're seeing in Bangladesh is that there's been mass digitization but in the aftermath of COVID-19. And this has been followed by a positive cash out experience. We're also, however, seeing gender differences when it comes to the workers' attitudes towards the change and when it comes to their use and how much they use and understand these digital views, these digital tools. Uh, additionally, we, we've also seen the cash is still very much dominant, which is to be expected because this is all very new to a large portion of the workers. But this is definitely something that we're keeping track of and we'll be reporting as soon as we see any indications of change. 
The first thing that I like to point out is the speed at which the sector has digitized. So in April of this year, 28% of our samples said that they received digital payments. And in May, as in a month after that, 76% of workers were saying that they received digital payments. Another interesting thing that we saw in May was that by mid-May, we reported that 82% of our sample was receiving digital payments. But then when we look at the data for the whole of May, we realized that the later the worker gets paid, the more likely it is for that worker to get paid in cash. So the number for May ended up being 76%, but still going from 28% to 76%, it's remarkable and it happened very fast. So we were also very pleased to hear from the workers that they were having a positive cash out experience. So about 88% of the workers were saying that they were able to cash out um, after the first try and 80% of them said that they only waited about 10 minutes or less in line. So overall, we're seeing high levels of satisfaction among our sample. Thank you. Um, in relation to that, at the Better Than Cash Alliance, we have developed a set of guidelines that help inform governments, companies, and financial service uh, providers on how to make the transition to digital payments responsible and how to make it responsive to people's and clients' needs. And when designing the transition process, um, one of the things that is of importance is that there is access to recourse, particularly for dealing with complaints about you know, innovative and unfamiliar products delivered via those new challenges. Uh, thank you for putting that slide there, colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm specifically talking about um, number four and number eight, and wanted to ask you, what does the data show us about the use and the access to recourse mechanisms? Yes. So this past week, we asked a new set of questions that were related to this. We basically asked workers where they would go to and who they would go to for help in case they, five things happened. So in case they lost their PIN numbers, in case they lost their debit cards, in case they lost their mobile phones, or if they had any questions about the amount that was deposited into their accounts or the amount that was, or the general questions about the account in general. And we gave them five options for each of these five questions, and those were going to the factory management, calling or going to the service provider's office, calling a family member, going to a friend or a coworker, or calling the government's helpline. And what we saw was that men basically picked calling or going to the service provider's office as the top choice in all of these five questions. Women chose the service provider in three of those questions, so whenever they had issues with the PIN number, when they had questions about the amount that was deposited into their accounts and whenever they had general questions about the account. But they chose family members as the first choice whenever they lost, they lose their mobile phones and they chose factory management <coughs> as the place where they would go to if they lose their debit cards. So overall, we saw that women were more likely to go to a family member or a factory management whenever they had problems. And we also saw that the government's helpline wasn't a very popular choice. So it was never chosen by more than 2% of the sample. Additionally, I would also like to talk a bit about the gender differences that we are seeing in the study. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Please. So as I said initially, overall, we're seeing high levels of satisfaction. So about 68% of our workers are saying that they like the change. But when you ask women and men separately what they think about the change, that's when you start seeing that there is a difference in the experience of a women government worker compared to a male government worker. So when you ask workers if they like the change, 62% of the workers will tell you, 62% of the women uh, workers will tell you that they like the change compared to 77% of the men workers. And then when you ask them how comfortable they are with the system, 62% of the women in our sample will tell you that they're comfortable with the system compared to 82% of men. We also asked them to select the reasons why they think the, the change was positive, and men were much more likely than women to, to select more positive feelings about the change. So about 44% of, of the men in our sample chose increased transparency as the reason why they like the change compared to 20% of the women in our sample. Uh, when it came to the ability to make transfers from home, 42% of men selected it compared to 21% of women. And the ease of transferring was selected by 42% of men compared to 24% of women. 
A similar thing happened when we asked them to select reasons for disliking the change. In that case, women were, more, were much more likely than men to select negative feelings towards the change. So 17% of the women in our sample said that they did not know how to use the system compared to only 6% of men. 29% of women said that the process of using the system was too difficult compared to only 9% of men. And when it came to loss of control of their finances, about 7% of women said that that was the reason why they didn't like the change compared to only 0.5% of men. So what this suggests is that there is a large number of workers in Bangladesh who see the value in receiving their payments this way. And we've seen it also anecdotally when we hear from workers that they feel unsafe walking from home, walking to home from the factories during paydays or how much they know that they're more likely to spend on unnecessary things the days that right after they get paid because they are carrying such large sums of cash. So I think that the problem is not whether they like it necessarily, but the issue or the biggest difference between women and men is in the sense of, in their own sense of confidence and belief that they can actually acquire the knowledge and the tools that are needed to actually take advantage of these new tools. And this is particularly evident when you look at the digital tool use data that we have. So when you ask workers if they're able to withdraw money without any help, 90% of men will tell you that they can do so without any help compared to 55% of women. If you ask if they can check their balance without any help, 91% of men will tell you that they can do it compared to 58% of women. And then when it came to transferring money, 82% of men said that they were able to do it without any help compared to 32% of women. And this is particularly noteworthy because we know that cash transfers are very common among our workers. So it's interesting to see that men are much more likely than women to know how to do these things um, digitally. So taking this into account, we looked at how financial education might have an impact. We looked at the sample of women that reported receiving some type of education or training on wage digitization, and they were much more likely to like the change than those that did not. So as you can see in this slide, 67% of the women with training said that they liked the change, 32 said that they did not like it and what had no preference. And then when it came to the women without training, 51% said that they did not like it, 47 said that they liked it, and 2% had no preference. So this suggests that financial education might be one way to jumpstart workers, and particularly women, into the use of digital financial services beyond just cashing out their payments. And lastly, we also saw the timing of the digitization. So those workers that were digitized before COVID-19, 78% of them said that they liked the change and 82% of them said that they were comfortable with the change. Um, that compared with the workers that were digitized after COVID-19, so very recently, 56% of them said that they liked it and 56% of them said that they were comfortable. So this suggests that the more they use the system, the more they get used to it and the more comfortable they become. Excellent, thank you so much. This is fascinating. And a really good segue, your final point on how to make sure that people use financial services beyond cashing in and cashing out is a great segue to speak to Valerie. Uh, Valerie, as the ILO social finance expert working on digital wage payments, among other issues that we discussed, how are you looking at this in the context of the whole of government industry as a response to COVID-19? And how does this transition fit with the overall mandate of ILO? Valerie, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Tida. Maybe first, I uh, would like to say a few words about the ILO social finance program for which I work. We work with the financial sector to enable it to contribute uh, more to decent work, which is uh, the mandate of the ILO, as everybody knows now. We engage with financial service providers and others to test new financial products, such as payments that we are discussing today, and also to test new approaches. So to come back to your question, yes, the transition that we see in, uh, in Bangladesh is very, very fast and super impressive. The data is from the Better Work uh, uh, factory. Uh, but one thing we should, uh, we should note is that, um, th that for the past five years, actually, in Bangladesh, the government, as well as business associations and brands, have pushed for digitalization in the industry. So the COVID-19 accelerated the trend, of course, and we see two key aspects that have accelerated the, uh, the trends. The first one is the uh, the financial package that the government has uh, launched for the sector 
and the uh, the package actually uh, uh, the government sets the precondition that wages needed to be paid digitally in order to have access to the package. And I think Masha has mentioned that, uh, that I mean, the, the enterprises didn't have any other options. And another aspect that uh, accelerated the trend is that right before the lockdown, actually many workers, and based on what my better work colleague said, it's more than half of the workers returned to their local communities, pushing factories to quickly adopt digital solutions. There were no other option. So I think by now we all uh, know that uh, the, the, the transition to digital wage payments uh, has a lot of benefits, right? For the workers, but also for the employers. There are opportunities, there are benefits, but of course it doesn't come with uh, without challenges. Challenges for the enterprises, challenges for the workers, challenges for the regulators, and challenges for the, the, the financial service providers. As this is the very first call of this learning exchange series, I wanted to share with you um, three areas of our work that we think are key to ensure a smooth transition to responsible digital wage payments. And I think it brings very well together the, the pieces together that uh, Mr. Singh, Masha and Danelia have uh, presented. So the first area is about developing the ecosystem and engaging with the, the, the financial sector to design solutions that facilitate workers' adoption, but also employers' adoption to make it easy for, for them to transition. The rise of digital financial solutions, including mobile money, has been a key opportunity in many countries to deploy payments and other financial services to people who were until recently unbanked. And I think Mr. Singh has uh, highlighted that very, very clearly. However, we know, and it has been uh, mentioned before, that more efforts are needed to tackle inequalities of access, knowledge, and use of digital financial services to meet specific needs of female or male workers, young or older workers, or migrant workers that, who are very uh, um, many actually in the garment uh, sector. The second area of work uh, is about uh, strengthening capacities of enterprises and their business associations to embrace uh, digital wage payments. So from the experience of my colleagues from Better Work in Bangladesh, but also from work we are currently doing in Jordan, but also in Vietnam, we see that enterprises seek guidance and support to engage with the financial service providers to design digital solutions, but also to negotiate the fees for the payroll service, but also the fees for workers when they, they want to cash out their money or they want to make transfers or payments. Another area in which they are seeking some guidance and support is to invest in technology and train their personnel. Also to build workers' trust and confidence in the new uh, wage payment system. And another point is really uh, guidance on how to address workers' grievance when they have issues to access their wages or issues to, uh, uh, with, with fraud or other uh, uh, problems. In the case of Bangladesh specifically, I think the requirement to transition so quickly in a month or so to have access to the stimulus package was a clear uh, challenge. In addition to this, this work we are doing in, in those uh, few countries, um, we feel there is a need for further analysis in the industry. First on the business case for the enterprises and in particular for smaller enterprises in the sector. So um, Masha has shown some, uh, some clear benefits for the enterprises. But we believe that there is still more work to be done in uh, in other countries, maybe, and also maybe in, in smaller, uh, mostly in smaller enterprises. A second area in which we would like to do more analysis actually is related, I mean, is about the potential of digital wage payments to further improve or facilitate enterprises' compliance with labor legislations. 
And this may include, for example, linking digital perils with social security and labor inspection mechanisms. We haven't started to work in that area, at least not myself. I may have some colleagues who have, but we are uh, discussing and we're exploring how we could uh, uh, work on that topic. As you know, we closely engage with employers organization and we trust that with the business case in hand, they can really play a key role to convey messages, tools, approaches to their members for a smooth uh, transition. And this is very true in the context of the COVID, but also after the COVID. It's clear that in, in countries like Bangladesh, it has, it has happened, but this is not what we see in many other countries. So uh, we, we believe there is more work to do to really engage employers, organizations to play their, 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 their key role. The third area is, of course, about developing financial capabilities of workers and engaging workers' organization. Daniela has talked a lot on, on financial education. Masha also has mentioned that. We do believe that it's not only about enabling workers to understand how to access their wages digitally, but really equipping them with the financial knowledge, skills, and tools so that they can make informed decision about their personal finance in order to build their assets and manage risks. Enterprises and workers' organizations have a crucial role to play in delivering this training to the workers. The ILO has a, a set of uh, training materials on financial education targeting workers targeting migrant workers, targeting women and youth. And we have trained, trained, trade, sorry, we have trained uh, trade union leaders in a number of countries, not in Bangladesh, nor in, in India for the time being, but it may, it, it may come in the future. We are planning actually to strengthen our efforts in this area, targeting in particular the garment factory workers. So these areas of work uh, resonate well with the, uh, the ILO global response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And it resonates very well with the, uh, the ILO uh, policy framework that was put in place to tackle the crisis. So the, the framework has four pillars. The first one is about stimulating the economy and the employment. The second one is about supporting enterprises, jobs, and income. Third one is about protecting workers in the workplace. And the fourth one is about relying on social dialogue for solutions. So we do, uh, um, we do feel our work really resonates with uh, this, this policy framework. Another, um, another initiative that was taken a few months ago is this call, for, call to action in the global garment industry. And finally, you may have followed last week the ILO Global Summit on COVID-19, in which or during which governments, workers, and employers have committed to combat the outbreak, ensure the safety of individuals and the sustainability of businesses and job. We do believe digital wage payments and the transition has, uh, can really contribute to build a better world of work after the COVID. And we look forward to exchanging with you and collaborating with you to make it happen. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Valerie. And uh, yes, hopefully this will indeed be a begin, a beginning of a, a new conversation and new partnerships as this very much fits in into the, the global context of workers' rights and benefits. So this is time to uh, hear from our participants. Thank you so much to all our panelists and the rich experiences and those testimonies you've shared with us. We already have two questions to you, Maisha. One is, and I'll just read both of them together, and then potentially you could respond uh, in, at once. That's okay. First is, how do you handle the challenge of having internet access, smartphones, and comfort of these workers to use digital payments? And the second one is, uh, generally the male members were the ones waiting to pick up the wages for the female workers, hence, when the wages shifted to completely digital mode, 
were they comfortable with this? Because sometimes such cultural barriers can also be very sensitive. Do you think that once they receive their wages into their accounts, they would still go and cash out immediately? Thanks a lot in advance. So we have three questions. One is the um, uh, comfort of using digital payments by workers. Two is about cultural barriers. And three, it's about cashing out immediately. Over to you, Maisha. Thank you, Tidar, and thank you for the questions. Um, so the MFS platform regarding internet access, the MFS platform is a SMS-based, text-based uh, system. So workers uh, actually don't need, for notifications, they don't need internet. Um, and when they are buying internet, internet is actually very cheap in Bangladesh, so they're able to buy the data um, and they're able to afford it. And like I mentioned, we actually have regular MFS training. Um, so special, and we give special women train, women-based training uh, for educating the women. Um, and we actually give loans to workers with special priority to women for in order for them to buy these smartphones. So that increases um, that increases their access to these phones. And uh, our IT I, our IT team has offers support during and um, during office hours and um, off office hours as well. And we have our um, hotline number that they're able to call when they have any problems. So for the sensitive issue about men, uh, yes, cultural barriers are very sensitive and we are still figuring out how to address these issues as we just started going 100% digital three months ago. Um, however, with time, we're seeing men adapt to this change in the household. Um, when more women are getting confidence to deny, to say no, to uh, give access to their PIN code to other family members. And faith in MFS is actually increasing. So with time, even in the last three months, we have seen that less uh, workers are cashing out immediately as they're seeing benefits to saving and insurance and other um, aspects of digital wage payments. Fantastic. Thank you. So thank you for the question. If you have any other questions, please yeah, don't hesitate to email us and then we can uh, follow up. Uh, unfortunately, we are, have to finish today. What we heard today is that in order for the transition to happen in the most responsible way, everyone needs to play their part. We heard from additional Secretary Singh, the role for governments in building the infrastructure and working towards a level playing field for innovators. We heard from uh, Ms. Khan that there is a role for factories and companies in taking responsibility for the payment services across the value chain. We heard a similar message from Daniela Ortega, which is workers turn to factory for information because they trust it and then the products need to be designed with their needs in mind as men and women perceive the transition differently. And then we also heard from Valérie Breda that developing financial capabilities of the workers and engaging workers' organizations is key to ensure the transition and products offered to workers actually make their overall lives and of course their financial lives better. And as promised, we would now like to hear from you and ensure that these calls, webinars, exchanges are most useful to you all and help foster actions and connections to support the transition. Uh, so we're now going to open the poll for participants and we would ask you to indicate through it your most pressing interest for the use of this future webinar series. We have two questions we would like to ask you. The first is the top three priority countries where you would like us to discuss learning opportunities. Uh, this is based on pre uh, questions we asked some of you. And then the second question we would like to ask you is indicate your top two choices for a deep dive, you know, in terms of the themes that you feel we need to discuss further. I will give you one or two minutes to finish it and then we will wrap up. Great. Well, I would like to thank all of you today for participating in this uh, first inaugural session of our exchange series, uh, taking the time to answer the survey. I would also like to thank again Dan Reese for opening the call and the leadership of both the ILO and the IFC ILO Better Work Program is driving through promoting and supporting the transition to responsible digital payments. Uh, please contact us for more information or if you want to get involved. 
uh, reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. And uh, we look forward to continuing discussing and working together to make the transition work best for employees around the world. Thank you and uh, stay well. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Okay.